All right, students, we're going to talk in this video about momentum and impulse. Momentum is a super important concept in physics. And really everything I'm going to talk about in this video and the next one, they really are things that you kind of know already because it's basically essentially just kind of rearranging Newton's second law in different ways. We've already um, done quite a bit of this. So I think it'll be somewhat intuitive for you. And um, as a way to start off studying momentum, I just want to revisit Newton's second law a little bit and remind you of a few, few things we've already talked about. Remember that a force obviously changes an object's velocity. Okay, So therefore, a force accelerates the object. And we know that both force and acceleration are vectors, and they're always in the same direction because of Newton's second law, which is F equals ma. We talked a, quite a bit about how Newton never actually said that F is equal to ma. He actually said that F um, is equal to m times um, the time rate of velocity of an object, which is actually going to be important here in our discussion of momentum, okay? So, second law of motion is 1687. The net force on a body is proportional to the body's acceleration and is in the direction of the acceleration, where m is actually the constant of proportionality, as we studied before. We said that the units of force was the Newton were the Newtons uh, and it's kilogram meters per second squared and then we kind of um, introduced I introduced this concept of momentum to you already and I said uh, this thing called P of T is actually MV of T and remember that all of these things are vectors as indicated okay now <clears throat> the time rate of change of velocity you know is acceleration so we can say that F equals uh, the time rate of the change in momentum, F equals, and I'm using the calculus notation here, which I've alluded to some in class. We've done some stuff about that in class, okay? Um, and this is really what Newton wrote, okay? He said, again, that the time rate of change of the momentum equals, to the, fo equals the force um, acting on an object, okay? And I want you to note that d by dt of v, or the time rate of change of velocity, equals acceleration. So lots of different ways, really, to just write the same thing. In other words, in his original words, the net force on an object is equal to the time rate of change of momentum of the object. Very important slide here, and exactly the same slide that you've seen before when we studied um, Newton's laws, OK? So here's your formal definition of momentum. It's simply the product of mass and velocity of a body. And P, and these are vectors, it's P is the symbol, and it's mass times velocity. The SI unit of momentum is obviously a kilogram meter per second. Okay. Notice that a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared when we divide this by T. Okay. So again, that's Newton's second law. Just want to point out that uh, momentum is a vector. It's a vector quantity that, quantity that points in the same direction as the velocity. And we consider only linear momentum in this class. There are other kinds of momenta, such as angular momenta, when things are going around in circles. But we're not going to really talk uh, too, too much about that, at least not in this topic, OK? OK. Now, since F equals the time rate of change of momentum, the net force on an object is equal to the time rate of change of momentum. The greater the change in momentum per unit time, the more work is done on an object over a certain distance. So in this case, we have a pretty massive object, which is a boat, going actually not very fast, all things considered. But you can see that the amount of work that it can do on this dock is enormous. And the amount of work that it can do on the other ships around it is enormous. Um, because it has a lot of momentum, and it also has a lot of inertia, and obviously momentum is directly proportional to inertia, because momentum is equal to mass times velocity, okay? So again, um, something very massive going slowly can do a lot of work or transfer a lot of energy. Conversely, something that's not very massive at all, such as a particle or a very small speck of dust or a rock, if it's going very fast, it can do a lot of work. Um, so things orbiting, like the space shuttle orbiting around the Earth, um, one speck of dust or one tiny, tiny little rock can actually shatter the window and do very, very great damage on the space shuttle. So they have to be very careful about those things. In either case, the product of mass times velocity is momentum. And if either of these two numbers is really, really big, even if the other is small, you can have a very, very large momentum. Okay? You see changes in momentum and worked on objects all the time. And really, it's the change in momentum, as we've seen, that's important. It's not so much momentum itself, but the change in momentum, because the time rate of change of momentum is the force, OK? So in sports, it's all over the place. Hockey, one of my favorite games. Um, momentum changes all the time. Uh, it's really 
um, pretty violent sport because basically because of momentum. And whenever there's a change in momentum, one object is doing work on another. Here's another, another kind of funny old movie. This, they're shooting this human cannonball at a circus, okay? Um, so the person comes shooting out of the cannon, and I guess this is real. That's not real. Anyway, uh, this, this person comes, and there's a lot of momentum changes here. Um, this person is supposedly being shot out of a cannon and landing in this net right here. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the idea of catching things in nets later. Okay, Pool, if you ever played the game of pool, that game is all about physics and momentum. Okay, So the cue ball hits one of the other balls. It transfers its momentum from the cue ball to, the, in this case, I think that's the eight ball. We'll talk about conservation of momentum and, and the transfer of momentum uh, and so forth, especially when it comes to billiard balls and other sorts of elastic type um, collisions, okay? <clears throat> okay, so I want you to think about if you go to the bowling alley one night and you forgot your bowling ball and instead you brought your ping pong ball, would you bowl with the ping pong ball? That would be completely ridiculous. Why? Okay, well, <laughs> if, you th if you throw a ping pong ball towards uh, to a bowling pin, which has a mass of about one kilogram, it's obviously just going to bounce off, okay? You need to use something that has a lot of momentum, uh, at, at least an amount of momentum such that it can impart energy to these pins at least enough to knock them down. Now, the mass of a ping pong ball is about three grams. The mass of a bowling ball is about three kilograms. And the mass of a bowling pin is about one kilogram. So if the ping pong ball and the bowling ball are moving at roughly the same speed, and change their momentum in about the same amount of time, clearly the bowling ball can impart about 1,000 times more force on the bowling pin. Okay? All right? So you see momentum, it's everywhere. And you get a feel. What's cool about momentum is that it's really kind of an intuitive thing. Um, I think a lot of it is common sense. And usually what happens in a collision when you're asked to calculate certain numbers, is usually what happens is what you would kind of intuitively sense would happen anyway. Okay? Okay, so consider the case of hitting a baseball with a with a bat, okay? The ball has an initial velocity u before the collision and a final velocity of v afterwards, okay? Um, usually v is greater than u in terms of magnitude because the batter swings, uh, swings the bat uh, and the ball goes very, very far. That's the whole idea, okay? The ball's acceleration, the average acceleration, is given by the change in velocity over the change in time. By Newton's second law, the sum of all forces equals f equals ma. A, I'm going to substitute this value of A, uh, V minus U over delta T in for A, and I get that F equals MV minus MU all over delta T. <clears throat> so therefore, if I multiply both sides by delta T, I get that F times T equals MV minus MU, which of course is the change in momentum. It's just another way of fiddling with Newton's second law. Um, but this expression, F delta T equals delta P, is actually very important. And it deals with something called the impulse momentum theorem, which I'll tell you about in just a second, okay? This, this, this expression, the product of the force and the time in physics, is called impulse. And it's a vector quantity, and it's, the symbol is a capital J, okay? This is the change in momentum. You can see clearly that uh, the impulse is equal to the change in momentum, and this is called the impulse momentum theorem. When a net average force exacts, acts on an object during a time interval, the impulse of the force is equal to the change in momentum of the object, assuming that the mass of the object stays constant. We're going to use this a lot in this class. This is a super useful theorem, um, and uh, it's really crucial for cert solving certain kinds of problems, as you will see. Okay? Okay. So, just a couple other things about momentum that are really important for you guys to understand. Newton originally, he actually didn't come up with the term momentum. He thought of the quantity of mass times velocity as being uh, what he called the quantity of motion, which actually is a pretty cool name. Okay, So obviously, when the velocity changes for an object, there's always a change in momentum. And remember, velocity can change uh, by direction uh, not, and, and not speed, right? By Newton... The only way to get a change in velocity is to apply a force F. So the force here is the average force applied over the time interval. Just to remind you guys, it's, it can be more complicated, but these are simplifying assumptions at this high school level of IB physics. Okay, if, if the change in time is very small, the force can be very big and vice versa. Okay, the change in momentum is a vector since momentum is a vector. Okay.
Now, the cases in which something changes direction by 180 degrees, or bouncing, often produce the greatest changes in momentum because the change in momentum is a vector. So in this case, we have, um, we have two balls hitting a wall. Uh, the red ball um, recoils and bounces back, and the blue ball looks like sticks to the wall. Okay? The, red, the red ball has a greater change in momentum. Okay? This all leads to some very, very interesting, um, some very, very interesting ideas. Okay? If you are walking down the street, and above your head is a flower pot on a ledge, and let's say, horribly, the wind comes up and the flower pot blows off and comes down and hits you on the head. In which case will you, will, will, will you be more injured if the pot breaks or if the pot bounces? Clearly, if the flower pot bounces off your head, it will impart a lot more force to you because in that case, the change in momentum is the same as if it didn't break, if it just... It, uh, is the same as if it broke, if it just kind of crushed and all the dirt came over your head and on your shirt and everything else, okay? In the case that it bounces, delta T is very, very small, which means that F has to be very, very big, and it does a lot of work on your head, and it can actually break your skull. In the case that the flower pot breaks and the, and the collision is spread out over a little bit more time, delta T is greater, so F will be less, and then that in that way, your head wouldn't get quite as hurt, okay? So this idea of momentum, again, very, very important when it comes to um, falling flower pots and what to do, okay? All right, so who cares? Well, hopefully I've convinced you how important momentum is, um, and especially if you're driving a car, you really care about momentum, okay? So let's say I have a case where I have a car and a truck, and they're going the same speed, same velocity. The mass of the truck is greater than the mass of the car, okay? Clearly, the more massive object takes longer to stop at a stoplight. The momentum of the truck is greater than the momentum of the car, obviously. Why? Well, if they're both going the same speed and the mass of the truck is greater than the mass of the car, that has to be the case. To bring both of them to a stop, there's obviously a change in momentum. And clearly, the change in momentum of the truck is greater than the change in momentum of the car. Since F delta T equals delta P, assuming that F is the same for both, the force of friction between the tires and the road, then clearly delta T for the truck has to be greater. Okay? All right? If that's the case, it takes it longer for the truck to stop, and it needs a greater distance to stop. Okay? All right. In the case of uh, two cars of equal mass, but one is going faster than the other, it's exactly the same case, okay? All right, so um, this should actually read, okay? Velocity of the red is actually greater than the velocity of the blue, okay? In this case, uh, but they have the same mass. To bring both cars to a stop, again, there's a change in momentum, but clearly the red car has more momentum than the blue, not because it's more massive now, but because it's going faster. And since F delta T equals delta P, again, assuming F is the same, the delta T for the red car is greater, and it takes longer for the red car to stop. So you see, um, it's very intuitive, right? Something going faster will take longer to stop. It's harder to stop it. Um, something that's more massive, well, it's, it's also harder to stop it, okay? So again, straightforward and common sense. Try this example on your own. Draw a diagram. So a ball of mass 200 grams traveling bounces off a wall. After hitting the wall, it travels at 5 meters per second, bounces, so it's going in the opposite direction. What's the impulse, okay? Well, just draw yourself a diagram. Before, I have originally it's going to the right, so U is plus 10. After it's going to the left, I have V is negative 5. F delta T is the impulse, which is the change in momentum. Here, your negative signs are super important, okay? Watch this. Negative 5 is my V, okay? Positive 10 is my U. That ends up being negative 5 plus 10 instead of 5, negative 5 plus 10. Very important. And I got 30 kilogram meters per second. Now, I've just harped on how important negative signs are. And your final answer... Your negative sign is actually not that important because check it out. It depends on how I actually define positive and negative. If I define, if, the, if originally the ball was going to the left and rebounded to the right, I would have a positive 30 kilogram meters per second. So the, the negative sign is important within the calculation, but the final answer, it doesn't really matter. It's fairly arbitrary. Okay, here's another one. Try this one. Similar, similar problem. I didn't draw a diagram. Um, but I got that, <coughs> sorry, I got that the impulse, um, which remember is J vector, 
okay, which I'm not showing here. Impulse is a vector because it's a product of a scalar and a vector. I got four kilogram meters per second. And again, the negative sign is not that important in the final answer, okay? All right, here's the problem. You really want to pause the video uh, for and really try this one on your own before you see my solution. It's the, it's the one with the baseball and the bat, but with some, some, some numbers now. Okay, the impulse applied by the ball to the bat, okay, well, that's just the change in momentum. And I got a change in momentum of 13.4 kilogram meters per second, okay? Um, so again, I'm keeping track of my positives and my negatives here, okay? Assuming the time of contact is not very much, the average force exerted on the ball by the bat, okay? You just divide delta P by delta T, and uh, you get, I got 8,400 newtons, which is a lot of force, but remember that's over a very small um, time, time frame. The average force exerted by the bat on the ball is the same, of course, by Newton's third law, but in the opposite direction. Okay, try this one. This is, uh, this is an old paper one, past paper one question. Determine the magnitude of the change in momentum of the ball in terms of the given variables. I know you don't like these kinds of problems without numbers, but go ahead and try this one. Okay, it's actually quite simple. Delta P equals M delta V, it's MV plus U. Now let me show you, I, you know that I love these slow motion videos of things happening physically. If any of you play tennis, you'll appreciate this, okay? Here's the ball originally going in the negative direction, negative delta U, positive, um, positive V in this case, okay? Um, check out how the ball gets like all deformed and wobbly. So cool. I love these slow motion videos. Anyway, delta P is M times the quantity V plus U in this case. A lot simpler than you think. Okay, here's another one that you're going to want to spend, uh, really pause the video and really uh, spend time working this one out in detail. Trust me, you don't want to just look at my solution and then just blow this off. Okay, so try this one. Okay. So the difference between a raindrop and a hailstone, basically. Okay, assuming that the rain comes to rest upon striking the roof of the car, find the average force exerted by the rain on the roof. Okay, and what I'm doing is I'm considering. This is interesting. They tell me the mass, the mass per second, the rate, the mass rate of um, rain, <coughs> 0.060 kilograms per second. Okay, if I consider the, just that amount of rain, its impact time is one second. Delta P is M delta V, which is F delta T. I solve for F, okay, and I consider only one second, and I get 0 0.90 newtons. Note that it doesn't matter what you use for delta T. If you incorporate the, the, the mass rate, uh, you're going to get an appropriate M up top that causes this ratio to be 0 0.060, kind of a clever way to solve the problem. Suppose hail is falling. We all know that cars get damaged during hailstones, and they don't get damaged during rainstorms. Why is that? Well... The force is way bigger, and simply the reason is because delta T in your impulse momentum relationship, your delta T gets really small when something when when hail bounces, okay? And when that delta T goes down, um, when this delta T goes down, the force goes way up. And delta P is the same anyway, regardless of whether it's bouncing or not. It's going from a non-zero velocity to zero velocity, okay? All right. Um, that's why hailstorms do so much damage to cars. Okay, and here's our last example. Go ahead and try this one on your own before you see my solution. Okay, so I have a 0.5 kilogram ball bouncing um, vertically off a hard surface. Okay, so this is a VT graph actually. Find the magnitude of the momentum change of the ball during the bounce. Okay, I got three kilogram meters per second, and the way I do it is as follows. I figure out what delta V is. Okay, all right, um, and I know that. Delta P is uh, would be would be six times the mass. Okay, so six times the mass is three kilogram meters per second. If the ball stayed in contact with the floor for 0.1 to 0.5 seconds, which is this interval right he, right there. Okay, what average force did the ball exert on the floor? I got 20 newtons. So make sure that you um, get the same answers that I got. And if, if we need to go through any of these in class, I'm more than 